director of the Center for Electron Science, and we focus on voting methods. So we focus on a lot of issues related to elections, but voting methods is one of our areas of focus. Uh, voting methods are a little bit abstract, and I didn't actually become interested in this for any kind of abstract way. I was interested in policy issues, just like I'm sure everyone here is. It was during the 2008 presidential primaries uh, that I was interested in healthcare reform, and I was at Indiana University at the time with a bunch of grad students. And so we were at a restaurant, and we were going around, and we were talking about the, uh, the folks that we were going to vote for. And I was a little surprised because all the all my fellow classmates they were talking about candidates that did not support uh, the healthcare reform that we were organized around, and this baffled me. And so I was a little frustrated with my classmates, and I thought, well. Either all my classmates are fools, or there's something going on here with uh, the way that we vote that's uh, coercing otherwise smart people to vote against their interests. And so that's when I started getting interested in voting methods. So we'll, we'll talk a, a little about, uh, a, a lot about voting methods, but as we're talking about this, just want a reminder that this is very proximal to the issues that we all care about. So first off, uh, when I say voting method, it's important that we all know what in the world I'm talking about. So what does it mean to vote? So when, when I think about voting, I think about it in two compartments. One is the expression, and then the other is the calculation of that information that you're providing through your expression. So by expression, uh, we typically see something on our traditional ballots, which is to just choose one candidate. That's a, a bit of information that you're providing. It's not very much information, but it's a little bit. You can also rank candidates. That's another way of providing information. Uh, approving as many as you want, sort of thumbs up, thumbs down, scoring on a scale. These are all ways of providing information. So that's one part of the voting method, the information that you provide. The second part is the calculation. So it could be just adding up the votes. It could be going through a particular algorithm. So you, you're doing something with the information to give you a result. So you have a winner and a bunch of losers. And the voting method should not only determine the winner, but it should also give you information about all the other candidates that were involved in the race. And so it's important to remember uh, that the voting method determines this person, the winner. And this winner determines the policies that affect all of us. It affects policies on environment, dealing with global warming. It affects poverty, homelessness, war policy and our healthcare system. So when I talk about voting methods, some of it will perhaps get a little bit abstract, but we have to remember that the voting method determines the winners, and the winners determine the policies which affect us. I'm going to talk about three different types of voting methods. I'm going to talk about our choose one method, plurality voting. I'm going to talk about approval voting, and I'm going to talk about instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting because the Green Party seems to, to like that a bit, so it seems appropriate. So with uh, our choose one method, its technical name is plurality. Sometimes it's called first past the post. Um, so its hallmark is this, this vote for one. So plurality, the directions on the ballot tell you to choose just one candidate. And so this is the information part of the voting method that I mentioned before. And just for, for, your, for your own experience, I want you to try to imagine for a moment a way to offer less information than to choose one candidate. <laughs> but that, that, that laughter is the reason why plurality voting is considered among academics to be the worst voting method there is. Because you start off with uh, practically no information. And then for some strange reason, we, have, we, we expect a good result to come out of it. And it doesn't happen, as we, we all recognize. Plurality voting, you choose one candidate. And then you uh, you add up uh, all the all the votes. So, uh, what are some of the minuses about plurality voting? So let's just imagine for a moment. Uh, so vote splitting is one of the issues. So when I say vote splitting, uh, we can look at this example. So say we're trying to figure out the best actor, and so we've got uh, a bunch of actors, four of them, that seem to be a whole lot like Michael Keaton, almost as if he had cloned Holly Shore. Uh, in some, some B movies, and so 79% of people say we, we like Michael, 
Keaton's platform. We like the Michael Keaton platform. And then the other 21% say, well, we like Polly Shore, uh, and Tino Man really made an impression on me. And so with uh, uh, Michael Keaton, if there are four candidates just like Michael Keaton, what happens is the vote splits four ways. And so the Michael Keaton vote is less than 20%. And even though people overwhelmingly like the Michael Keaton platform, split four ways, less than 20%, is less than Polly Shore. And so uh, you can have a terrible candidate, absolutely terrible. 79% I mean, uh, of people don't like uh, Polly Shore. And yet here, because there are four people just like Michael Keaton, uh, Polly Shore wins. And so this, this vote splitting, we see this all the time in elections. And it, it's absurd that because we use this particular voting method that limits our expression of information and the way that it calculates it, that we can have a result where people overwhelmingly prefer one candidate over the other. Uh, and you can have such a bad winner. So it's not like Pauly Shore was like sort of a close, close second favorite, uh, but drastically different as far as preference. And then the other issue that we have is something that we call favor betrayal in the, in the voting method world. And what I mean by this is something that I'm sure all of you have experienced. Uh, so you go to your friends and you say, there is this Green Party candidate that is awesome, and they agree with everything that you agree on, uh, so you're perfectly aligned with one another. You should vote for this person. And your friend something, says something like, Oh, well, that's great. They do agree with everything that I agree on, but I am not going to vote for them because they are not going to win. And so this is a terrible behavior that plurality voting exhibits. And so even though we may love a candidate, it could be our perfect candidate ever, if we perceive, if many people, if they perceive that uh, that candidate isn't going to win, they do not vote for that candidate. And that results in otherwise great candidates getting an artificially low amount of support. And plurality voting does this. So some of the pluses of plurality voting are choose one method. It's really easy. So you choose one candidate and you uh, add up all the votes. And another reason why plurality voting is good is because, well, that's, that's about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, that's plurality voting. So approval voting is another way uh, of voting. Again, we've got those two components, the expression part, and then we've got the calculation part. Right here, we're talking about the expression part again. So the expression part of approval voting is to choose, we're not ranking or anything, we're just choosing as many candidates as we want. And then the second part is to simply add up those selections. So we vote or approve of as many candidates as we want, and we just add them up. The candidate approved the most or voted the most wins. That's approval voting. Some of the minuses of approval voting. And <clears throat> here you, you have to forgive me. Voting methods, while many of them can be, uh, are very simple, uh, when we explain and get into them, they can be a little bit complicated. And I will try to make that as much not the case as possible. But I, to, to be complete, I want to try to touch on some of the criticisms of, of approval voting. One looks at something called the majority criterion, which says that you shouldn't have a majority of people prefer one candidate over the other and then have the uh, minority candidate win. Approval voting technically violates this, but it does it in such a way that is not a big deal. So <coughs> here we're looking at an example where we have one group of voters, that and there are 100 voters total. 99% of them have a slight preference for Abe over Barbara. And, but because it's approval voting, they say that they choose both of them. So 99%, so while having a slight preference for Abe over Barbara, they choose both. The group B, just one voter, prefers Barbara over A, and so uh, they choose just Barbara. And so here we have a result where even though most people had a slight preference for A over Barbara, uh, Barbara wins. So in this example, this doesn't come up, uh, this isn't something that's very likely to come up, uh, but in the result, what we see here is that even though we had perhaps a less than desirable outcome, uh, the result is not catastrophic. So even though these voters te technically got their, uh, their lesser preferred candidate, uh, they, they still like that candidate an awful lot. So one of the things that you're seeing with approval voting, all voting methods have their hiccups, but some voting methods are simply better than others. 
Um, and what you see, but they all have their, their hiccups. With approval voting, when it does exhibit some strange behavior sometimes, what we notice is that the results are not catastrophic. But we can see right, at, right away with our other issue with plurality voting, that when we saw a vote splitting, we saw a catastrophic uh, uh, result. So Pauly Shore winning in that other sort of hypothetical uh, election, that was a terrible result. People overwhelmingly did not like Pauly Shore by a lot, and they got Pauly Shore in that election. So another issue that comes up is something called uh, later no harm with approval voting. Um, one of the things that you notice with approval voting is that it has a, a big preference for uh, the electorate as a whole. So it wants to make sure the electorate as a whole gets a good result. So with later no harm, uh, there's one issue where you have to decide whether you want to support multiple people or whether you just want to put all your eggs with that one person. Uh, here, uh, we can have it so that if in the election, if you uh, go ahead and choose both your compromise candidate and the candidate that you like the most, you could make it so that uh, you make it the person that you like the most doesn't win and your compromise wins. Um, so that's one criticism and that it uh, perhaps encourages people just to go with their favorite and that's it. But there's a risk there with approval voting. With approval voting you have this nice thing where you can look among the front runners and you can say, okay, well, I really don't want that other candidate to win. Perhaps I don't want that Republican to win. And so I'm going to hedge my bets by perhaps also choosing this compromise candidate, this, this Democrat perhaps. But I'm also going to choose my honest favorite. And so approval voting gives you the opportunity to hedge your bets. But if you decide to go all in and just choose your honest favorite and not compromise, there's some risk there. So that's all this is saying. So some of the pluses of approval voting. So we can go back to this vote splitting issue. So we've got uh, the Michael Keaton platform uh, where he's cloned himself and we've got Polly Shore. So before we ran into an issue where we had 79% of people liking the uh, Michael Keaton platform, but it was split four ways because we had four candidates just like Michael Keaton. And then we had Polly Shore. Well, if we're doing approval voting here, we don't have to worry about splitting our vote. If we're indifferent as to which Polly Shore uh, wins or if they're all pretty close to us, uh, if we like all the Michael Keatons and, and we're pretty indifferent or uh, we don't have very strong preferences among them, but we really don't want Paula Shore to win, well, we can go ahead and support all of the Michael Keatons and our vote isn't split anymore. And so this voting block stays cohesive, whereas before it split up and you have a vote swing effect where a highly undesirable candidate wins. With approval voting, you don't have to split your vote up. This is especially helpful in primaries when you have a lot of candidates that are running that happen to be similar. The other issue that we saw with plurality voting was the favor betrayal issue where uh, you can't choose your honest favorite in some cases. Well, with approval voting, we do not have to worry about that. This idea of always being able to choose your honest favorite, this seems like something that's pretty simple and that most voting methods should allow. Well, it turns out that mathematically it's actually really difficult for a voting method to be able to have this property of letting you choose your honest favorite no matter what. And that's exactly what approval voting does. It doesn't matter what the situation. It is impossible to have a situation under approval voting where it hurts you to choose your honest favorite candidate. So if you go into an election, there's a Green Party candidate and they're using approval voting, it doesn't matter if that Green Party candidate is not going to win uh, it doesn't matter if it's independent and everyone hates that candidate. If you like that candidate under approval voting, you can always choose that candidate. And if you want to hedge your bets by having a say in the outcome, you can still do that. Uh, approval voting gives you that freedom, so you can always choose your honest favorite. Ranked choice voting. This is one the Green Party uh, has a, a bit more of a background with. So with ranked choice voting, uh, there's the expression element. So with voting methods, there's the expression, there's the calculation. Ranked choice voting. It lets you rank your choices, but notice, in, uh, and also ranked choice voting uh, has other names like instant runoff voting, um, so we're all talking about the same thing here. In practice though, with ranked choice voting, the expression element limits you to choosing just your top three choices. So you're, you're giving your expression of your first three preferences in order. <coughs> and the second, the calculation element, this is uh, a bit more complex. Instant runoff voting, it takes the, that information, those rankings, and it, it uh, pushes them through an algorithm. It looks at the information that says, uh, look at the first choice uh, votes of the ballots, and is there a candidate that has more than half of the first choice votes? 
If yes, that candidate wins. If not, you look at the candidate with the least number of first choice votes. And then you eliminate that candidate, have that candidate's ballots transfer over to their second choice votes, and then you now treat them as first choice votes. Now you look at all of the, all the, all the ballots, and you ask them, uh, of the remaining ballots that are there, do the first choice votes, are those greater than half for any particular candidate? If yes, you have a winner. If not, you go through that loop again. Calculation is a little bit more uh, complicated with instant runoff voting, and there's some key points in here too that are important. The first step, looking at the first choice votes. So it, it looks right off like in the expression part that you're providing a good amount of information. So you're providing your choices for the top three, but the algorithm, at any one point, it's only looking at a part of the information. It's only looking at the first choice votes. It's not looking at the rest of the information. So the second choice votes, there's on, on instant runoff voting's radar uh, at, at, at any one moment. The same thing for the rest of the ballot. The other part, uh, you look at the votes of the remainder. So as this process goes through, you get ballots that are exhausted. Uh, you have people that don't rank their entire ballot. And so uh, ballots get eliminated. So when it asks that question each time in its algorithm, does any candidate have more than half of the first choice votes? It's only looking at the remainder of the active votes. So uh, sometimes you hear the idea that instant runoff voting always gets a majority, but it's important to recognize uh, that, that within that claim, it's only a, a majority of the remaining ballots, not all the ballots that it started with. So, so instant runoff voting, you've got the ranking, and then you've got the algorithm that it uses to calculate the results. So I'm going to talk about the drawbacks with instant runoff voting. One thing that instant runoff voting does is it can create a scenario that happens about 5 to 15% of the time, depending on which uh, simulation that you use. Uh, it can have an effect where voters can rank a candidate that's higher, and it will actually hurt that candidate. And vice versa, it's possible to rank a candidate as lower and actually have it help that candidate. Uh, there's a technical term, which I won't be asking you again, called non monotonicity which describes this property. Uh, this is just an example of this happening, uh, of, of how it can occur in an election with, with Greens. Uh, and this has happened in actual elections. So this, this happened in Burlington in 2009, in their election. But this happens about 5 to 15% of the time. And when instant runoff voting chooses a winner that is also not the plurality voting winner, uh, we see double the rates of this occurrence, so uh, 10 to 30% of the time. Uh, the, the other property, which I mentioned before, that instant runoff voting falls short on, uh, so with pre-roll voting, you can always choose your honest favorite no matter what. Uh, sometimes it's proposed that with instant runoff voting that you can always choose your honest favorite. This is actually not true. Uh, with instant runoff voting, because its algorithm is a bit complex with the way that it calculates votes, it's difficult for me to explain this verbally, and so we actually created a video on it, which I'm going to show you now. Let's say there are two major parties in your city. Imagine that you like one better than the other, so we're going to call them the good party and the bad party. Here's the good news. The good party has a 10-point advantage in your city and wins most elections. The bad news is that your city uses plurality voting. And the upcoming election for mayor has three candidates. And you really like the independent candidate this time. Even though he's your favorite choice, you know you can't vote for him. If he takes too many votes away from the good candidate, that would cause the worst candidate to win. Wouldn't it be great if your city used a voting system that didn't have this problem? How about instant runoff voting? Then you can vote for your favorite. With instant runoff, when your ideal candidate gets eliminated, your vote moves over to help the good candidate win. That's great, right? But what happens when your ideal candidate does even better? What if he actually beats your second choice and your second choice gets eliminated? Unfortunately, that puts us completely at the mercy of these voters that we have no control over those who voted for the good candidate. And who did they put for their second choice? It would be nice if they had all put our ideal candidate second, but they didn't. It takes only one-fifth of them putting the bad candidate second for him to win this election. What happened here? Doesn't instant runoff eliminate the spoiler problem? It turns out that putting your favorite first in instant runoff is only safe when your candidate is very strong or has no chance at all. In between, there's a good chance he will have to face your least favorite candidate before he's ready. 
In this way, putting your favorite candidate first can cause your least favorite candidate to win. Ouch. In fact, if you and some of your fellow idealist supporters had forgotten to show up, then your favorite candidate would have been eliminated, but your second favorite candidate would have won. Does this problem happen in every election? No, this does not happen in every scenario. It doesn't happen this way when the third candidate pulls supporters from both of the major candidates equally, but it does happen whenever he pulls mostly from one and not the other. Hmm. To me, that sounds like a lot of the three-way elections in America. What about later no harm? Instant runoff advocates are fond of quoting the later no harm principle. Adding a second choice, third choice, or more to your ranking will never hurt your first choice. Guess what? This is completely true. But note how carefully it's worded. It never says that it's safe to put your favorite candidate for your first choice. With instant runoff voting, your first choice has to be a safe candidate. Someone who can beat your least favorite. Putting your favorite candidate first might cause your second choice to get eliminated and your third choice to win. So later no harm is great, but it's not a promise that it's safe to put your favorite first. Be careful voting for your favorite with instant runoff voting. You might eliminate the strongest candidates and cause your least favorite candidate to win. If you want a voting system that avoids this problem, then you care about the favorite betrayal criterion. The favorite betrayal criterion says, voters can never get a worse result by expressing the maximum support for their favorite candidate. Approval voting is one system that passes the favorite betrayal criterion. So Deluxe said, favorite betrayal and demonstrated that this runoff voting actually does not pass the favorite betrayal criterion uh, and that it's not always safe to, to rank your honest favorites first uh, a property which approval voting does pass every single time so some of the pluses of instant runoff voting now plurality voting or choose one method is an awful awful voting method uh, and so it's very sensitive to screwing up which it does all the time whenever there are more than two candidates and it's very sensitive to the spoiler effect. Instant runoff voting, to give it credit, it does mitigate the spoiler effect. So when you have a third party that's not particularly strong, uh, it's, not too, it's not terribly difficult to have those votes transfer over to another preferred candidate. So it does mitigate the spoiler effect. So, and the other part is it's just not plurality voting. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, plurality voting is a terrible, terrible voting method. Uh, the bar is very low to beat plurality voting, and indeed, instant runoff voting is better than plurality. Uh, looking at some of the studies done on approval voting, so in 2007, there was a, a study done in France. Now, we may not uh, recognize a lot of these names here, but there's a pattern that approval voting has. So here in 2007, we see two of the major party candidates uh, from uh, in France, and we see all of these are third party and independent candidates. Now, here it actually turned out that we had a new winner, which is not always the case with approval voting. It's, uh, sometimes uh, the winner within the voting method is the same in all, practically all the voting methods. Uh, a winner in plurality may very well be the same winner that you'd find in instant runoff voting and approval voting. In this particular election, what we saw, however, was that um, uh, a more moderate candidate happened to win under approval voting uh, compared to when just regular plurality was using. And that's a common theme with uh, approval voting, is that it tends to favor moderate candidates. And for a particular electorate, the moderate candidates, and you can imagine a normal distribution of ideology from voters, a moderate candidate that fits right in the middle of that mountain of, 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 uh, of voters is the one that represents them best. So whatever moderate means for picture or accurate, uh, approval voting tends to favor that candidate. And so that's how this particular candidate got so much support in this case, because this is a moderate candidate which approval voting tends to favor. Now, looking at all these other candidates, we see a huge growth in, uh, in support when using approval voting uh, compared to plurality voting. So here we see uh, almost six times as much support, eight times, ten times, nine times, nine times. You can imagine if the Green Party got five to six or seven times as much support as they do now. And the reason that this happens is because of that criterion, that favorite betrayal criterion. Approval voting can always choose your honest favorite. And the other nice thing about approval voting 
the algorithm, the way that it calculates those, it looks at all the ballot information. So what you're seeing here is all the information that people gave on, on their ballot all at once. You can't do that with IRB. Um, and, and, and while you do it with plurality, you don't start with any information to begin with, so it doesn't even matter. Um, so here you see much, uh, a much more accurate reflection of support uh, from third party independence, which is a, a common theme that we see in approval voting. Here, uh, 2009 study in Germany. Uh, here the result was the same with plurality and approval voting, but you see the same pattern here. All these third parties and independents, they all get a ton more support under approval voting compared to plurality. And again, that's because you can always choose your favorite in approval voting, and that causes third parties and independents to get a much more accurate reflection of support. And here we see another look at uh, a comparison uh, which is uh, an exit poll study done by Occupy Wall Street. Now here the, the numbers are going to look kind of strange uh, just because it's in New York City, so if this seems like a little bit of a liberal electorate, that's because it is. So here we see uh, plurality voting, and some runoff voting, and then we see approval voting here. Now what's interesting here is uh, when you look at plurality voting and you look at instant runoff voting, they look very similar. And that's because with instant runoff voting, you're only looking at a snapshot at any one point. And so here you're just seeing the first choice votes. Um, and so it, it, it's difficult to give you that reflection of support for, uh, for third parties and independents. So but when we think about a voting method, it's not just important who wins. It's important to also see how the particular voting method gauges the level of support for all the other candidates. Because that has a huge effect. Um, a lot of the time with uh, the media, they'll make this argument. They go something like, well, if your ideas were any good, you would have polled better or you would have done better in the election. You did terribly in the election. You polled terribly. And so your ideas must not have been any good. Uh, so that's the rhetoric that they give and the excuse that they give for exclusion. That is based on a, a false assumption and it begs the question as to whether the way that they measured that support was any good in the first place. And it wasn't. And the reason it was because they used plurality voting, which is an awful, awful voting method. But when you use approval voting, and we see here uh, with approval voting, you have, this is, includes Stein. Um, so Stein got under 4% with both IRB and plurality um, when, when you look at the, uh, the, the snapshot that IRB gets. With approval voting, when you can see all the information at once, uh, you see uh, over 50% approval for Stein, Obama still wins in the landslide. Uh, but you, you get that accurate reflection of support. So when third parties and independents are able to get that accurate reflection of support, you can't marginalize them the same way. You can't marginalize a candidate that's getting 20, 30, 40 percent of, of support. You can't keep them out of debates and you can't call their ideas stupid anymore when they're getting that much support. So that argument that they use doesn't work the same way anymore when you're using approval voting. I'll show you one quick video on approval voting. What is approval voting? Simply put, it's a better way to run an election. Let's take a trip to Plantsville. It's election time, and Mayor Blueberry is campaigning hard for a second term in office. She won the last election with 65% against her opponent, Mr. Squash, and she still enjoys strong support. Once again, Mr. Squash is quick to challenge Ms. Blueberry, but this time they're joined by a third challenger, Mr. Peach, who shares similar views with Mayor Blueberry. Mr. Peach sweet talks almost half of Blueberry's supporters into switching their vote to him, while Mr. Squash holds the same 35% he had last time. The votes are counted. And what's this? Mr. Squash wins? Blueberry and Peach have split the fruit vote. How did this happen? Peach's supporters also like Blueberry, but couldn't say so on their ballots. A simple solution is to change the ballot from vote for one to vote for one or more, allowing everyone to state all the candidates they support. This is called approval voting. With approval voting, the election would have gone quite differently. Peach's supporters no longer fear that a vote for Peach will help elect Squash. Instead, they show their sincere support for Peach and also Blueberry. They want to prevent Mr. Squash from winning, and they do. And approval voting accurately reflects Peach's support. Mayor Blueberry wins the election. Democracy is restored.
Approval voting is more than just a smart idea in Plantsville. It's a smart idea anywhere you vote. Approval voting is used by organizations across the globe, and for good reason. It's democratic because the candidate with the most support wins. It removes the spoiler effect. Even losing candidates get an accurate reflection of support. And voting your favorite never hurts you. Start the conversation on approval voting and share this video. Then join the Center for Election Science at electology.org. Better voting starts with you. So this is the last slide, let me put it right in front of this. Um, so uh, approval voting isn't something that we have to wait for our government to give us. This is something that we can do in internal elections right now. So here, just as an example, I looked at the candidates for the Green Party uh, uh, presidential nominee. Um, and so this is a, a simple thing that you can do in these regular ballots. All you're doing is just changing the direction to choose one or more. Um, and there are a bunch of, you, unfortunately, uh, you won't be the first one, so you, uh, but you will follow with a lot of great company. So uh, as uh, Kat mentioned before, uh, there's the Texas Green Party uses it, the Texas Libertarian Party, the National Reform Party uses it for their nominee, uh, Colorado Libertarian Party, National League Party, German Pirate Party, so lots of third parties use it, but also organizations. Uh, United Nations has been using it for a while, a bunch of math organizations, uh, we were the consultant for the Webby Awards this year. They do internet um, uh, internet awards. It's a large, multi-million dollar organization. We were the consultant this year. They used approval voting uh, because of us and uh, Mathematical Association of America. Uh, we're also starting to uh, make contacts at ESPN as well as other athletic organizations to try to change the way that athletic awards are, are voted on as well. So this is something that's useful in a variety of contexts. Uh, including with third parties, organizations, so, questions. Uh, this uh, seems to make sense when you've got a, a winner-takes-all election where there's only one person elected. Yeah, this is a, a, that, that's a good point. This is, uh, we're talking about this within the context of a single winner election, yeah. so mayors and governors. Uh, yeah. Within multi-winner, like, we have to have a completely different conversation. This well, is complicated. What, can, can you give some idea of that conversation? Say, say we're voting for uh, okay. uh, members of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, the, like the, a city the, council or something? The, yeah, SC for, for the Greens, where we've got two or three people on the, on the uh, uh, that will be elected out of a, a group of five. Okay. What do you, uh, so a committee. What works for that? Okay. So. If, if you're doing something like a committee, um, you have to ask a couple questions. Uh, so here, you're talking about a multi-winner election. Three people are being elected at large all at the same time. Uh, so you have to think of what's important for you. Um, if you want your winners to be very similar and sort of grouped around the, the median of whatever the ideology or the feeling is of the electorate, uh, you can use what's called a block system. And a block system under approval voting is pretty simple. Uh, so you would have all of the voters choose as many candidates as they want. So you're doing, looks just like a regular uh, approval voting ballot. And then you take the top uh, three votes, the top three vote leaders. And then that'll get you a result, which is very homogenous with its outcome. Uh, but they're all going to be clustered around the middle. Now, if you want a proportional result, um, proportional voting methods tend to get a little bit more complicated. And you can still do that with approval voting. So say you want those three people that are elected to be the first, so the first person that wins will be right in the center, and then you have the rest of the people representing uh, groups that didn't get their say within the first person elected. And to do that, you have a, an approval voting ballot, so you choose as many as you want, and then uh, it'll get tossed through a, an algorithm which reweights the, the value of a ballot for people that got someone elected. And so they have a little bit less power within their ballot after they get someone elected. And that gives other people the opportunity to get someone elected. That's how uh, it works with, the, with the, in a, in a proportional version of approval voting. How, does, how would uh, range voting or some other system treat that situation in terms of 
uh, again, people from the center or, or people from... Uh, so, so score voting um, is uh, another is a, is a different voting method, um, and like Kat said, that a score voting score voting works by uh, you score each candidate on a range, say zero to nine, uh, and the candidate with the highest score wins or highest average it doesn't matter. It's the high, highest number. Of yeah, the highest score. Yeah. So the candidate with the highest score wins. Uh, and now are you asking how that would work with the multi-winner context? Yeah, well, how would, what would that do in terms of getting a variety or people yeah. from the center? Okay, so score voting, like approval voting, tends to favor moderate candidates or candidates that are aligned within the center. Um, so just like approval voting. Uh, and uh, the, the way it's block version would work? Uh, I, I would think that if the, if the, Bell curves, if the bell curves yeah. Yeah. for each of the of the candidates was very skewed, that it could also give variety, couldn't it, to some extent? Uh, it'll hit your right in the median. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, approval voting and score voting, they tend to get results that are right around the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's important to say, whatever middle is for a particular electorate. So. Uh, a moderate in San Francisco is going to be a different than a moderate in rural Texas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So is score voting basically like approval voting? It's just a different kind of approval voting or what? Yeah, so score voting and approval, vote, approval voting are both within the same sort of class of systems called cardinal systems. Um, called what? Cardinal? Cardinal systems. It's just cardinal? The name, yeah, cardinal, like the bird. Um, and they uh, they tend to uh, both elect moderate winners. Uh, the way that a score uh, for a multi-winner election using score voting, if you wanted a block uh, outcome uh, that was more homogenous with your winners, you do the same thing. Just take the top three scores, and you do a similar effect with if you wanted a proportional outcome, uh, you would sort of you uh, eliminate the vote. You, you, you would you would dock the, the, the weight of a particular ballot once the, once the voter got what they wanted. That way other people got a chance to have their say. So it works similarly. Um, but now as far as performance goes, approval voting and score voting, score voting works a little bit better as far as how it performs, but not a ton better. Uh, and that's why we mainly push approval voting. And this is what Kat said as, as well in, in her experience, is that while score voting tends to perform a little bit better than approval voting, Approval voting is just so easy that you sort of just give up the slight performance uh, uh, difference and, and just say, okay, this is just so easy, we're going to go with this. How, how often is it likely that it changes the actual outcome? Uh, between score and approval voting? Yeah. Not very often. Uh, but when we say that, like, we're doing simulations of millions of elections. So we do computer simulations to, to sort of uh, measure how good a particular method is. And, and so we um, in, in what percentage? Two percent? Uh, as far as difference of outcome, um, I can't give you the number off the top of my head. It's, it, it's also going to depend on the number of candidates that are running as well. Yeah. Uh, so those variables are something to keep in mind. Uh, and it won't give you a, a drastically different candidate. So uh, it'll be a difference between like one moderate A and moderate B. So it won't give you uh, it won't be the difference between moderate A and extreme candidate A. Like it, it, it won't be that. So it gives you, it'll give you a similar outcome, but it'll just be a little bit different if, if it gives a different result. Yeah. So a uh, clarification and a question. Um, when you say that uh, uh, score is slightly better, but um, it's much more complicated, you're referring to both one, one seat and multiple seat. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. both of them, yeah. And then the question is, what uh, can you give us examples of where uh, uh, range voting or score voting is used? Um, score, we, uh, let's see, on, on our website it has a bunch of them listed. Oh, okay, uh, I'll check. That. Okay, um, and we actually, for the Webby Awards, uh, for the first round, they use score voting. So, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there any way to sort of like um, game the system? Like, does, does it, if you have somebody that just, or, or people that are not informed and they just go in and check everything, is that, does that see things in yeah. the first place, yeah. in the second place, or, or like for instance, um, if 
if there's primaries where you can go over to the other side and like they, they want to knock somebody off that's going to be a strong candidate in the general mm -hmm. election, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So they have everybody go in and they, they just uh, uh, approve one person mm -hmm. so that they make sure that that, you know well, what I mean? Yeah, you, well, you, can, you, can, you can, it's risky to do that under approval voting. So you can perhaps get away with that a little bit more with, with another voting method, but with, with approval voting, if you go all in for your favorite candidate uh -huh. and you try to have someone else not win, well, you, you run the, the risk of your candidate that you really like uh, not winning and you don't get any compromise candidates as well. So it's a little risky if you try to go all in and not compromise as well. Okay. Does, that, does that answer your question or, or is there something else to it? Um. So if you have, but so it's encouraged that people vote for more than one, you're saying? It, if you vote for just one, yeah, yeah. then, and you, and you get a lot of people to just vote for one. So sometimes it does make sense for an individual voter to choose just one, uh, but it's important that they have the option to choose as many as they want. So like imagine a scenario where, um, say we're back in 2000, and uh, we really like Nader, uh, so we've got, uh, and we'll just simplify this, so we've got Nader, Gore, and Bush. And we'll pretend we're in a world where uh, Gore is doing terribly. And so in, in this situation, we may vote for just Nader. If Gore is like in an underapproval voting, getting like 5%, not going to do well, um, then we want to make sure that uh, we're just beating Bush and we can vote for just Nader. But if we're back in 2000 in the real world, uh, and say we're using approval voting, uh, well, we want to vote for Nader, but we also want to head our bets uh, and vote for Gore at the same time uh, to make sure that uh, Bush doesn't win. So, and I mean, you can vote for just for Nader. It's like, say, uh, if, if you're someone that thinks, well, Gore sucks really bad, and there's hardly any difference between Gore and, uh, and Bush, well, you can vote for Nader, and you can toss some other third party candidates on there, too. Uh, you can vote for everybody but the major party candidates, and you get a lot of freedom of expression. So, yeah. It would seem like in a case like that where you've got two corporates, one of which is not too much better than the other, uh -huh. and one candidate who is really good, if you had the choice of uh, uh, putting 10 votes for, for the guy you like real well and three for the guy you like you could stay. Well, you, can, you can only choose each candidate once. So you choose well, them. No, I'm talking about range voting. If you do oh, okay. range voting. Okay, so you, so you, you, you score them. Yeah, okay. if you score yeah. them, okay. you, can, you can score the guy that you could put up with at maybe three uh -huh. and, and the guy you hated at zero. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. you, you, and and then, then your guy, the guy you believe in could have a better chance of winning. Yeah, yeah. So you do get a little bit more flexibility with score voting. That yeah. that that is true. Uh, and on the ballot, like as far as expression goes, score voting is as expression is as, as expressive as you can get. So mm -hmm. as far as information that you provide, you can't get any better yeah. than that. Um, but uh, um, so that that is a plus for score voting. What what we find though when we do computer simulations is that um, the, the the difference just in practice uh, for the electorate as a whole as far as how they do and how uh, well, uh, how good of a winner they get for a particular electorate. Not a huge, like, there is a difference between score voting and approval voting, but not a huge difference. Um, and if you want to, if you want to go that route where you get that extra level of expression, you can do that, but you sacrifice some simplicity that you get with approval voting. Yeah. I don't see that as com a complexity that's too hard to deal with. I, I wish there were other people that agreed with you. So it, uh, the um, one of the nice perks about approval voting is that it's uh, just ready to go. You can use yes. regular ballots with score voting. Uh, it is a simple method, and there are much more complicated methods. But you have to use a new ballot, and so just a little bit different for people. Uh, with getting people to use approval voting, just getting them, giving them the idea that they can choose more than one candidate, uh, which is I mean you see similar things when you, like, even with uh, some of the obstacles that instant runoff voting faces, um, like just having a new ballot is, is a challenge. So one of the perks of approval voting, same ballot, just different instructions to say you can choose as many as you want. So.
Yeah. So this, elim this eliminates the primary. Uh, we don't. We technically don't need a primary. So one of, one of the issues with the primary is that uh, it gets around the vote splitting issue, which plurality voting or choose, or choose one method is really sensitive to. So approval voting does a nice job buffering against that vote splitting issue, um, and so you can just toss everybody in there and have the person with the most votes wins, and you save a bunch of money from skipping your primary. Huh. Yeah. Any other questions? What about if uh, if Situation where the uh, Tea Party knocks off uh, a, a, a strong Republican, mm -hmm. and that strong Republican then runs in the, in the election anyway. Uh, in the general election. Well, sometimes uh, some states have uh, I think they they would call it sore loser yeah, laws. You can't do that anymore. No yeah, and, and they, they say that uh, you lose in the primary, you don't get a run again in the general election. Um, but let's, let's pretend that's not the case uh, for some states that we're talking about. Uh, so the scenario is you've got a primary, uh, Republican primary, and Tea Party candidate wins. Uh, and then and the, the, the loose and Republican runs as an independent. Yeah, yeah, and then they jump in for the independent uh, spot. Now, if we're using approval voting here, um, so we can talk about it in a different different situations. One, whether one when approval voting is used in the primary, if you want to have a primary still, and then another when it's used in the general election. If we talk about it in the first instance when it's used in the primary, we should remember that approval voting tends to get you a more moderate winner. So if moderate uh, for whatever electorate happens to be the Tea Party candidate, then the Tea Party candidate may still win. But if it's not the case, then the winner would be someone that is more geared towards uh, uh, a moderate uh, candidate, whatever that is for that particular electorate. More people approve of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that will actually probably be a pleasant uh, outcome for some Republicans because I'm sure they don't like being upseated by Tea Party folks. Uh, and in the general election, uh, again, approval voting tends to prefer the moderate, so uh, if uh, moderate does not mean Tea Party, uh, and if that Republican is a little bit more moderate, that Republican will have a better shot in the general election uh, if they're using approval voting. Yeah. Yeah. That, now, you, you, you perhaps heard me say a couple of times, uh, a few times that uh, approval voting tends to elect moderates. And that's true. Like, our organization is nonpartisan. We talk to everybody. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. We talk to plenty of libertarians. Um, as you can see, we've worked with them directly. Uh, but we don't care as far as ideology goes. But we, we do see that consistency of approval voting favoring uh, moderates. But while it, it may not cause you to, to win, although if there's, a, if there's an issue that the major parties aren't taking up, you can take that issue and, and run with it. and. Uh, that will get you a lot of support that you would not be able to get under plurality because if you did that on plurality, uh, they would just say, well, you didn't get much support, your idea must have been bad. Um, but under approval voting, you can do that same thing, and that can give you a good chance of, of, of being competitive. Uh, but even if you don't win, remember, you still get a, a much more accurate reflection of support. And so even in that case, you can't get marginalized the same way, even if you don't win. So you still get to bring all your issues up. So the Green Party and Use and race. I I think I think they should. Um, so what would be the consequence of that. So in general, so we make collective decisions all the time. I, I heard you make it tons of them or planning tons of them uh, during the, the workshops. Uh, so there's no reason why you can't use a pool room when you're making those collective decisions. It's also a whole lot easier than doing instant runoff voting every time, which it sounds like that's what you're used to doing. Uh, so you can just add them up. You get a good result. And it didn't take you all day and a lot of frustration to do it. So it's, you get a, a, a good result and you don't have to rack your brain. So and you can save mental energy for all the other stuff that you have to do. Would that, would that, would that have to influence any other parties or influence the general system? Well, if you start kicking their butt with good candidates, it might. So, yeah. it, uh, it'll get you. Um, Sort of the median um, uh, candidate for the Green Party, so that's that's what they would do because that's your electorate in this circumstance. Yeah. What about uh, support from the established party? So would it would approval voting help them? Um, no, 
is there any support for moving to something like this generally? Uh -huh. or so like in practice? On, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, as, as far as getting voting methods implemented for government elections, um, with approval of voting this hasn't been done, done yet, uh, we're actually uh, uh, working on developing a sister organization, a C4, uh, to push this more directly. Uh, we have been involved in uh, a, a number of pieces of legislation at the state level, uh, which isn't strategically the, the best way to go, but it just happened to fall in our lap and they asked, like, would you help us with this legislation? And we couldn't say no. Um, but the, historically, the way alternative voting methods have been implemented have been at the local level. So you do a referendum where the city council says, uh, we'll sign off on this, you don't have to collect signatures, or you do an initiative and you can collect signatures and put it on the ballot. So historically, that's the way that it's been done. And because this is a single winner voting method, we'd like to, we'd like to see this uh, started with uh, small cities for their mayor. So, uh, in, in, the, in the interim, uh, because voting methods in general, people got no, have no clue about them. Uh, but they do love sports. And so uh, in, in the interim, what we're doing is we're working to have other organizations use smart voting methods like approval voting uh, that way, people are familiar with them. Um, so, so things like Heisman Trophy, MVP, or whatever sport you like. Uh, yep. All things. Yep. Yep. Uh, actually, we. Uh, um, I, I wrote an article with our uh, chair, who's also uh, uh, a PhD mathematician, on the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame election process. Uh, so we did that for a sports blog called Deadspin, which is a popular sports blog, and. Uh, uh, we came up with a, a way for the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame to induct uh, new people. Um, that was a lot better than their current system that they're using. So it, it, that, that sort of indicates the variety of context that voting takes place in. And we'll be diving into all of them. That way people have more familiarity with these systems. And they can start saying, well, if they use that for this, and it works so well, why do we use this awful plurality method when we elect government? That seems so important. So that's, that's the tactical plan.